The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. If you're looking to start or upgrade your online presence, visit www.sonicwebstudios.com for all of your online needs. Sonic Web Studios specializes in custom web design, app development, social networking, search engine optimization, domain registration, email marketing, online stores, and more. Since our birth, we have been designing and developing immaculate websites and providing web solutions which are a cut above the rest. As a leading web designing enterprise, we have a team of extremely talented web designers designers who are well focused and have the experience of working on multiple web developing platforms such as PHP, Magento, Custom WordPress and more. Sonic Web Studios has been helping businesses of all kinds whether big, small, established or startup impress their audiences with exemplary web solutions. We don't just create beautiful and functional websites, we give you a complete online solution with the main goal of enhancing your yearly revenues. We aim to give your business the online exposure and brand acknowledgement that will help you in achieving increased conversions leading to profitable sales. Call 1-800-303-3960 or visit us online at www.sonicwebstudios.com to get started today. Mention The Mike Wagner Show and get 20% off your project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Voting just isn't going to the polls on Election Day anymore. Options like early voting, mail-in voting, and ballot drop boxes are available to more voters and are growing in popularity. How to Vote, a tool created by Democracy Works, breaks down the options your state offers for casting a ballot, empowering you to decide when and where to vote. Democracy works best when we all vote, but misinformation and confusion about election procedures have resulted in low voter turnout. How to Vote, a tool created by Democracy Works, takes the guesswork out of the voting process. How to Vote is an easy to use and help folks from all over the country overcome many of the process barriers to voting. Democracy Works is committed to helping you vote no matter what. Their tool, How to Vote, does just that. You can sign up for election reminders, see what's on your ballot, get step by step assistance requesting your mail ballot, explore your options for returning your voted mail ballot, check your voter registration ch- status, find your polling site, and make sure you have the appropriate ID. Decide when and where you'll vote this year at howto.vote. That's howto.vote. Even though this is a presidential election, there are many more candidates on the ballot besides the president. Go to Ballot Ready for a nonpartisan guide to your entire ballot. From there, you can compare candidates based on stances on issues, biography, or endorsements, and then save your choices to use when you vote by mail or in the voting booth. You can even request your absentee ballot or make a plan to vote early on or election day. This election matters. Make sure you have a plan to vote and vote in form. And this year, with changes to polling places and vote by mail laws as a result of COVID, it's more important than ever to have a plan and vote. Local elected officials affect our lives every day. They decide who to prosecute, monitor the quality of our drinking water, and choose the leadership of our schools. 30% of voters take time to vote and then leave some part of their ballot blank. This is a missed opportunity to choose the leaders of our communities. It's okay if you're unfamiliar with some of the more local positions. We recommend hosting a ballot party, get together with friends over Zoom, split up the research, and go through the ballots together. Go to BallotReady.org and enter your address to make a plan to vote and vote in form. That's BallotReady.org. The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. If you're looking to start or upgrade your online presence, visit www.sonicwebstudios.com for all of your online needs. Sonic Web Studios specializes in custom web design, app development, social networking, search engine optimization, domain registration, email marketing, online stores, and more. Since our birth, we have been designing and developing immaculate websites and providing web solutions which are a cut above the rest. As a leading web designing enterprise, we have a team of extremely talented web designers who are well-focused and have the experience of working on multiple web developing platforms such as PHP, Magento, Custom WordPress, and more. Sonic Web Studios has been helping businesses of all kinds, whether big, small, established, or startup, impress their audiences with exemplary web solutions. We don't just create beautiful and functional websites. We give you a complete online solution with the main goal of enhancing your yearly revenues. We aim to give your business the online exposure and brand acknowledgement that will help you in achieving increased conversions leading to profitable sales. Call 1-800-303-3960 or visit us online at www.sonicwebstudios.com to get started today. Mention The Mike Wagner Show and get 20% off your project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. 
It's now time for the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. The Mike Wagner Show can be heard on Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, iTunes, Anchor FM, Radio Public, and the themikewagnershow.com. Mike brings you great guests and interesting people from all across the globe. So sit back, relax, and enjoy another great episode of the Mike Wagner Show. Everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs at below the competition way. Call at 1 800 303 3960. That's 1 800 303 3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show, get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Widener Show can be heard on the MikeWidenerShow.com. You can check our Facebook page at Facebook.com slash Mike Widener Show. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also on Anchor FM, Radio Public, iTunes, Google Play, and over 25 podcast platforms. Take the Mike Widener Show with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Widener Show on the YouTube channel. Also, follow the Mike Widener Show on Instagram and Twitter today. We're here with the director of a brand new Jimi Hendrix movie, and he's been in the directing business. For number and number a number of years, and it's basically he literally started at zero and just worked his way up. He's known for films with a heart that focuses on humanitarian issues, and he the, the movie's originally titled called Roomful of Mirrors, and uh, we'll talk about that. And also directed A Lion's Trail, A Place Like Home, and also worked with the, worked on the Who, the Incredible String Band, yes, and more. And you know, after reading about this guy, I like him. To direct my biography. Live, ladies and gentlemen, from the Plus Studios, somewhere in the UK, ladies and gentlemen, the director of the brand new Jimi Hendrix movie starting at zero, Peter Neal. Peter, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Mike. Thanks so much for having me on your show. <laughs> oh, it, it, it's such an honor to have you on as well, too. I've been looking forward to it. So, um, you got a new film about Jimi Hendrix, which will be coming out called Starting at Zero, and you've been directing this. And it was originally titled Roomful of Mirrors, and uh, we'll talk more about that. You're best known for um, films with heart that focuses on humanitarian issues. And, of course, you also directed Lions Trail, A Place Like Home. You also worked on The Who and Crowful String Band. Yes, and more, and both for. Before we get into all that, including about starting at zero, tell us how I first got started. Well, in the film business. <laughs> yeah. Or I can start, you know, before that, wherever you want. So, I mean, wherever you start, it's up to you. I'm open. Well, I started in the film business uh, much like uh, Jimmy started on the chitlin circuit, doing the grind, making all the, all, the, <laughs> all those boring films about the machinery and this and that and the other. Uh, but but I, I kind of progressed out of that in a few years into making uh, um, films for TV, really. about uh, One section of me was making films about wildlife, and the other section was making films about current affairs. So it was a kind of interesting, uh, interesting introduction. Mm. I worked for an independent filmmaker who was, uh, who was uh, uh, kind of very keen to bring on new directors. So he gave me lots of interesting jobs and things. And it was while I was working on some other film that this guy burst into my edit suite um, it happened that I, I didn't know this guy, but he'd, I'd interviewed his wife apparently a few days earlier, and he just grabbed me and he said, you have to come with me right now to the Albert Hall to see this amazing guitarist. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, so we, you know, he, he dragged me up, not dragged me because I was very willing to go, <laughs> uh, being interested and having, you know, started really making music films because that was my other passion, music apart from filmmaking, but he dragged me to the Albert Hall <laughs> and there was Jimmy doing a sound check and in the front row was Clapton and Beck and Townsend, I think. I can't remember exactly who was there, but it was like the cream of the British guitarist, the, the royalty, sitting there with their mouths open watching this guy <laughs> do his sound check. Uh, and uh, John, who was, who was John Marshall, who was the producer of the film, eventually, what we made, said, we have to film this guy because he's not going to be with us for long. 
And I, you know, at the time I didn't think much about that, but since then I thought, wow, you know, he knew something I didn't know at the time. But he thought he was like a, a shooting star and he was going to burn himself out. You know, right, is, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because the energy he was giving out was so huge and because, you know, um, well, that's another story, but Jimmy got into some fairly bad company later in his life. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. And of course, you know, he says, and the wind cries, Mary, get me out of here along the watchtower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that was because um, his girlfriend, Kathy Etchian, uh, didn't, he didn't like the way she cooked. So he, he, she, she threw the plate on the floor and smashed it and Jimmy walked out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh he, he he ended up following her, but she got on a bus, so he missed her. And he was by traffic lights at the time. So when he got next day, apparently he walked in the studio and they just recorded Wind Cries Mary in one take. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> so way. whether he had it in his mind or whether he'd written it overnight, I don't know. But uh, it's a kind of interesting story. <laughs> Oh my goodness. And and of course, you know, um be around Jimi Hendrix as well too. And you know, what was it like for him to be around him and um also interacting with his bands and maybe some of the things that uh, we don't know about Jimi Hendrix. We see him in print, TV, radio, media, internet and everything else, and maybe some things that um just kind of blows us away about him. Yeah, you know, well I think I think the thing about Jimmy was that he was he was one of those extremely charismatic figures. Um, I've heard it said about Robert Johnson, the blues player, exactly the same thing, uh, that you could be in a room and Jimmy would walk in and everybody would know his presence would be felt palpable, you know. Um, so kind of when I when I first met him, I was uh, I was struck by how what a gentleman he was, you know, how, how uh, very modest, very kind of quiet, gentlemanly guy. Uh, obviously, we're very well brought up <laughs> by his parents. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's a very, very kind of flamboyant figure. I mean, we, we, I remember walking with him through Soho uh, to go to a, 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 sh a, a photo shoot, and uh, he was dressed with all his, you know, hats and feathers and brightly coloured coat. And uh, it, it just felt very surreal walking through London, which was, to be honest, was a very grey place in terms of what people wore in those days. Um, uh, so, so, so it was quite an extraordinary experience just to be with him in the street like that. And then we got to the studio and uh, we'd arranged this photo session because um, Jimmy was being marketed as, as the wild man of Borneo. Uh, which is about as far from the truth as you could could go, <laughs> but it was successful. It was a it was a really good marketing campaign to bring in notice. You know, the guy who you wouldn't want your daughter to go out with that kind of thing. Um, and we did this photo session. We interviewed him. I asked him what was the the questions he hated being most asked most, and then I got Mitch and Noel to take turns to ask him those questions. <laughs> it was, it was, Jimmy had a very sly sense of humour. You know, he was a very funny guy to start with. I mean, he was very sharp. And uh, he, 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 his answers were always kind of coded in a certain way. So that was a good trick. And then I'd, 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 I'd thought about um, trying to get him to play some acoustic guitar. Uh, and I brought along a 12-string guitar I had at the time. And I left it in the corner of the studio uh, I, I restrung it for a left-handed player and just <laughs> put it in the corner of the studio and just hoped that he noticed it, which of course he did. And I think we just we'd finished filming the interview and various other bits and pieces, and then he just said, uh, "Do you mind if I play that guitar?" <laughs> <laughs> so I said, "Yeah, yeah, that's okay." Yeah, uh, kind of hoping you might say that. And then he picked up the guitar and he he started playing a few notes and, uh, and then he, he said, you know, um, can I start that again? And we were running out of film because we, 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 were, we were making this film on a shoestring. Mm -hmm. So we only had a, f a few reels of short ends left. And I said to him, uh, you know, yeah, 
you know, whatever you like, but we, we might run out of film. So he just launched into this absolutely perfect version of Hear My Train and Coming. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> uh, you know, and it was faultless. You know, having just fiddled around on the guitar for a few minutes, he was absolutely faultless. And that was just such a stroke of luck, really. <laughs> That that is amazing as well too, and of course we're starting at zero as well too. It takes it from um, you, you know just um, describing the beginning of Jimi Hendrix all the way to the end, and I guess it's just kind of like um, you, you know just similar to um, what other musicians have been through, and also uh, almost like you know what happened in the sixties is reflecting now. That's what it seems like we're starting at zero. I mean, just amazing. Yeah. Well, I think, I think I mean, you're right, absolutely. I mean, uh, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, the scenes on our streets are looking like the 60s, you know, uh, and the kind of protests look like the 60s. Um, but, you know, I think, I think that's certainly true. But I think also that the, the, real, the dreams and aspirations of people haven't changed from the 60s. They want, they want uh, a just and equitable society. They want peace. They want uh, to get on with their lives, basically. Uh, and uh, and all that social revolution in the 60s is really kind of proving to be kind of like a, a, a sad thing, that it never moved on from, 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 from those beginnings. Um, but, you know, I mean... I think on both levels, Jimmy was was very reflective of the sixties, and that's why I'm, I'm trying to do a, 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 a an online event on the on the on the eighteenth or nineteenth of September, um, which I'm going to show about thirty five minutes of clips from the film to tell his story and to to to, to, deliver, to deliver his message basically, uh, because I think it's a message we we missed at the time and we should re really okay. listen to again. <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> exactly. And of course, um, you, you know, if Jimi Hendrix were, were alive today, do you think um, his, his words of music would still influence a generation today like he did 50 years ago? Well, I think they have influenced music today. I think, you know, he was a pioneer of, uh, of um, so many forms of music, uh, of, you know, from, from metal to, to funkadelic to... Uh, rap, uh, um, acid house, you name it, he's there in that music today. I think he remains a, a huge influence on music because his music was, was, was revolutionary. I mean, you know, it can't be stressed too much that nobody played like Jimi Hendrix and nobody ever will. But that music is timeless, I think. <laughs> and, and I think a lot of people today, um, you know, most people today probably know Jimi Hendrix from video clips, which is, which is obviously going to be performances. But he only ever performed about a third of his repertoire on stage. The rest of it, he never performed live. So there's a huge part of his music which a lot of people aren't even familiar with. Um, so I, I brought that into Starting at Zero. And Starting at Zero, the title really means it starts literally from zero, from before he was born. It was when Jimmy said, um, uh, "Before I can remember anything, I can remember I can remember music, stars, and planets. I could go to sleep and write fifteen symphonies." <laughs> <laughs> That's his opening words in the film, because the film is entirely narrated in his own words. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, how is this portrayed within uh, for a generation that's not familiar with Jimi Hendrix? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix is still one of the most powerful musicians on the planet 50 years after his death. How is it portrayed within starting at zero for generations that's not familiar with him? Well, I, ho I hope it will introduce them to him if they don't know about him, because he, he is pro probably one of the most influential and talented musicians and composers of the 20th century. So people should, <laughs> I mean, he should live on <laughs> in that sense, simply mm -hmm. If you like, simply because of the music, because the music is is so so spectacular, and the sounds he made. I don't think anybody else could make those kind of sounds. I remember going to a convention in in, uh, in this country in 1984, I think, uh, Jimi Hendrix convention that I was asked to go to, 
And uh, I was curious as to why some of the people had turned up because there were these kind of very ordinary looking sort of 30 year olds with a 10 year old boy. And I asked them, you know, what made you come to this event in this muddy field? <laughs> they, said, they said, well, it wasn't us. It was him who brought us pointing to their 10 year old. So I said to the 10 year old, well, you know, you you weren't even born when Jimmy died. <laughs> what is it about what is it about Jimmy that, that that attracts you? And he said, it's the sound he makes. And I think that's literally the key to it. It's that sound is something very, very special. You know, you've heard the you've, you've heard the old stories about good vibrations. <laughs> and uh, the healing power of vibrations and the awakening power of vibrations. I think, I think, um, you know, um, people in the war, in the Vietnamese war, they used to listen to Jimi Hendrix, Bob Marley, uh, Carlos Santana, people like that, because it was music that gave them the courage to go on. <laughs> And I think there's something about the sound of that music that is it, it breaks illusions. It, it, it brings you back to who you really are. Because when Jimmy performed, what was interesting about a lot of his performances, whatever country you know he was playing in, whether it was Germany or Sweden or the UK or France or Italy, people in the audience felt he was playing specifically for them. Uh, you know, I've heard people say, oh, he was playing in this... Uh, concert in germany and he was playing german music <laughs> german music oh my gosh you know people back then you think of german music as the polka and tuba and eating i know so oh was speaking, was speaking, what they meant was it was speaking directly to them you know uh -huh. you know you felt you felt he was playing for you personally when you were in an audience when he was really on his top form it was so spectacular uh you got so involved in the whole thing Mm -hmm. and, and and of course, too, that uh, you originally titled Room Full of Mirrors, they changed it to Starting at Zero. And, um, you know, just simply why the title changed, Room Full of Mirrors, it sounds like that, um, you know, he was in a room full of mirrors, just having a wall of sound and everything like that. And, um, you, you know, it sounds like it's a project that kind of just evolved over time. Well, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the concept, the reason we called it Room Full of Mirrors was because of a poem he wrote. And also he made a song called Room Full of Mirrors, which goes, I used to live in a room full of mirrors. All I could see was me. So I took my spirit and I smashed the mirrors. Now the whole world is here for me to see. So it's a, it's a story about breaking the walls of illusion, finding your, your, your real true self. Um, so that was the, the origins of the title, Room Full of Mirrors. But unfortunately, in the period when we were prevented from finishing it, um, somebody wrote a book, Charlie Cross, a very good book about Jimmy, a biography, and he called it Room Full of Mirrors. <laughs> no! So it sounds like somebody indirectly stole from you. Oh, my God. Well, he did, he did get it from my wife. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't mind, you know. I mean, well, so we had to retitle it in the end. So... Uh, um, we came up with this idea of starting at zero because uh, uh, one of the one of the nice things Jimmy said I was born at the age of zero. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that makes sense. I think I'll describe my um my life as starting at zero to where I'm at. Maybe in Call yourself starting at zero to where you're at, and anybody for those are watching, listening, starting at zero. And I think that's really good, too. So <laughs> we'll talk more about the starting at zero in just a minute. But first, listen to the Mike Widener Show at the themikewidenershow.com. It's powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable, custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960 or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Widener Show, get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Widener Show can be heard on the themikewidenershow.com. You can check our Facebook page at facebook.com slash themikewidenershow. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also on Anchor FM, Radio Public, iTunes, Google Play, and over 25 podcast platforms. Take the Mike Widener Show with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Widener Show on the YouTube.
YouTube channel. Also, follow the Mike Widener Show on Instagram and Twitter today. We're here with director Peter Neal of Starring at Zero, the new film about Jimi Hendrix here on the Mike Widener Show. And um, as you directed the film when you started in um, 1967 when you first met him, what are some of the challenges and triumphs in making the film? In, in making Starling at Zero? Well, uh, the, the challenges were what kind of film we were going to make um, because there have been a lot of documentaries about Jimi Hendrix. Um, formulaic thing here's a bit of concert here's somebody talking about him here's another bit of concert you know the talking head show <laughs> and also and also the comments all being from other people who may well you know, to a greater or lesser extent have known Jimmy but it wasn't him talking about himself <laughs> ever. <laughs> so we decided that you know the basic concept for this film was it was uh, it was to be Jimmy's film. Um, I mean, it's really hard to define the film other than the fact that there was no pre preconceived notion about how it would work out. Uh, it was really made from bits and pieces, and I, I started from by listening endlessly to his music, and I had access to some. 900 hours of tapes that had been left in the studio when people had just left recorders running when he was doodling and jamming and playing around and uh, home home tapes that he'd done when he was writing songs. And he'd always said um, that his music was his diary. So I literally took that as an instruction. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I can get the music to work to tell the story, then everything else will fall into place. So I spent a lot of time rearranging bits and pieces of music till I got what I felt was the kind of curve of his life, if you like. Um, and then because we'd, we'd, uh, we'd, we'd researched all his, his um, interviews and poems and bits of paper he'd scribbled on in restaurants and hotel bedrooms, we we managed to I managed to to kind of fit that together as a as a book, in which he tells his story from his birth to um, bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> the the untimely death at twenty seven seems to be the um, magic number where uh, so many yeah. people have gone to, gone away too soon, and uh, fortunately many of us have gone past twenty seven. And I don't want to think about that number to be honest. <laughs> No, I think that's a bit of a, a bit of a myth, really. I mean, I know there were a lot of twenty-seven clubbers. Um, in fact, Robert Johnson was the first twenty-seveer, and then you had all the sixties ones, the Janis Joplin's and the Kirk, um, not Kirk Cobain, he was later, but uh, uh, Brian Jones and Jimi Hendrix, of course, um, and lots of people have, have this mystical thing about twenty-seven. Which is understandable, you know. If you if you're into numerology, it's quite a significant number. <laughs> but, uh, but I think I think one can read too much into these things. I mean, the fact the fact was that he he left us too soon. <laughs> that's a fact. <laughs> I I have to say this about uh, my significant thing with 27. My single life had died and went into married mode when at right. 27. So go figure on that one. <laughs> Well, there you are. That's a game changer. <laughs> what can we say? <laughs> oh, I know. I'm just simply saying the, the those who uh, worry about 27 as well, too. And, um, you know, let's get back to about uh, some of the challenges and triumphs. And um, you, you talked about uh, up the time of the 27 and um, maybe some of the other things that, um, you know, some of the challenges and things you're still may or may not know about Jimi Hendrix, like his influences and, um, you know, how he got these ideas, the genesis of the songs and, you know, what inspired him to write all the lyrics, you know, Hey Joe and, um, you know, along the Watchtower and all just all the classics. I mean, every Hendrix uh, fan um, just knows all the songs, you know, the the inspiration to all the lyrics and um, everything else behind it. Yeah, well, I, th I think, um, I, I mean, I think, um I interviewed Carl Santana a while back about Jimmy, and he said, uh, you know, Jimmy, uh, like, people like to put him in a box of he was a blues player, he was a rock player, he was a this player, that player. But what Carlos said was, Jimmy played life. <laughs> and I think that's really 
the best way of putting it. You can't box him. You can't. He hated being wrapped in cellophane, as he called it, or put in a box because that was so unnecessary. He says, there's only two types of music. There's good music and there's bad music. You know, like there's only two types of films, a good film and a bad film. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Attitude. And I think that what, uh, by saying he, 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 his music was about life, was it was it was very personal for him. He took, in, he took a lot of incidents out of his own personal life and started off writing a song. I mean, like Wing Christ Mary, for instance. Um, but there were other influences from his childhood when he, you know, because he had a pretty unhappy childhood. Um and then he took that into a universal area. Um, he took that personal thing and made it a universal thing so that it was uh, something that was not just about him, but about everything that was going on. And because he was a very kind of intelligent guy, he, he, you know, he was experiencing the world and what was going on in the world. And the 60s was a very... Uh, traumatic decade, <laughs> you know, there was a lot of darkness and violence in the 60s, as well as all the flowers and peace and all that business. It was, it was, a, it was a pretty, pretty uh, uh, tumultuous decade altogether. So he had a lot of material to work from. I mean, like Machine Gun is about the Vietnam War, undoubtedly. You know, he, the folly of war, how, you know, you're, you're, you're killing members of your own family. Why are you doing this? Uh, mm -hmm. So, and I think 1983 was about climate change, um, as was Up From the Skies. You know, I've, I've been here before. i come back to find a world that is burning. <laughs> very, very much a prophetic vision of, of what's going on today. <laughs> it, it, it sounds like it, too, and a couple of songs that came to mind, too, Purple Haze and Foxy Lady, you know, just, um, you know, it's based on those. And I'm sure that um, some other Hendrix songs will pop in my head as uh, time will go on. So basically, I guess, I guess we're just kind of like just going on with it. And I'm sure Hendrix would have just popped some ideas in his head. Um, like like talking to you and I, I'm sure ideas will pop in his head at random. Yeah, well, he's, he always said Purple Haze was about a dream he had, about uh, living uh, under the sea and being hit by a purple ray. <laughs> Uh, but other people have, 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 have said, no, it's not. It's about some other substance that he took. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, Jimmy was very kind of cautious about saying what his songs were about because uh, for him, you know, they were personal, but they were you could make of them what you like in a way. I mean, Purple Haze was the first real Jim, Jimi Hendrix song because uh, Hey Joe was actually, you know, a, an old ballad that he uh, he did. He called it a cowboy song, I think. <laughs> uh, it's not really where we're at. <laughs> and then, of course, Purple Haze came out on the, those first two chords. I mean, nobody had heard anything like it. It was, it was just uh, so extraordinary that it, it blew everyone away. I mean, it just cracked open the music scene totally. <laughs> People started scurrying. <laughs> They're couple. like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, I mean, people, people were scurrying for cover when they heard that. Uh huh. And, and also, too, um, you know, Foxy Lady, that's been uh, very popular, and that's one of the songs that resonates. And also, Are You Experienced? And I think to me, that definitely just, I, I would have to say, in my opinion, I'm sure Jimmy would disagree. That pretty much sums up Jimi Hendrix. Are you experienced? Oh, yeah, uh, no doubt. I mean, Foxy Lady, um, we said about that that. That's about the only happy song I've ever written. <laughs> <laughs> so I think Foxy Lady was simply what it says it is. <laughs> he loved he loved women, <laughs> uh, but are you experienced? Definitely was a very serious song in that sense. I mean, he was trying to he was trying to tell you all to come along with him <laughs> and become experienced. You know. Mm. Um, I know I, there's, a, there's a famous cartoon of Jimmy applying for a job. And the interviewer is saying, yes, but Mr. Hendricks, are you experienced? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. No wonder I was seeing those cartoons. I see, I see, Mr. Hendricks, so you have this, but are you experienced? <laughs> I did have a vision. You're right. And I'm feeling these visions. I mean, <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, I bet you Hendricks is in the room right now. He says, yeah, it's going to be in cartoons after all. I can see that. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, no, I mean, all, all his songs were about, I think, things that are very... I think they were very relevant in the 60s and reflecting what was going on and what was troubling the world at that time. But I think they're just as relevant now because exactly the same things are troubling the world today. <laughs> and we're still threatened by ridiculous war. We're still... We're still kind of living in a in a society that's unequal. Where, in fact, it's even more unequal now. Where some group of a few people hold ninety percent of the world's wealth, <laughs> and people are starving to death. And uh, you know, we've got we've got terrific prices as well. Uh -huh. eight, last last number and counting was eighty million people are now dispossessed from their lands and homes. You know. Serious people. Wow. Yeah. yeah. There's a oh. lot, isn't it? <laughs> oh, my goodness. And, and, of course, you know, we'll talk about uh, some of the other films that, um, you know, touch that as well, too. Sort of an offshoot with um, with Jimi Hendrix. And before we get to that, uh, where can people see the film starting at zero? Well, they won't be able to see it till the end of the year, probably. But as I say, I'm putting on this virtual event, if you like, in September on the 50th anniversary of his death, um, which you can find out about at jimmyhendrixreturns.earth. Um, uh, and it's really going to be, I'm going to talk about him, his, his influence, his messages, and then we're going to have a kind of Q&A afterwards and also um, hopefully some music too. So mm -hmm. that's uh, that kind of is like a, a way of, of, of trying to... Uh, awaken people to the film that's going to be coming out later in the year. <laughs> that is great. We're looking forward to that, and we'll talk about some of the other projects you've worked on as well, too. But first, listen to The Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Widener Show. Get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Widener Show can be heard on the themikewidenershow.com. You can check our Facebook page at facebook.com slash the Mike Widener Show. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also on Anchor FM, Radio Public, iTunes, Google Play, Apple, over 25 podcast platforms. Take the Mike Widener Show with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Widener Show on the YouTube channel. Also follow the Mike Widener Show on Instagram and Twitter today. We're here with director Peter Neal of Starting at Zero, the new film about Jimi Hendrix is be coming out at the end of the year and also the 50th anniversary of um, Jimi Hendrix as well too here on the Mike Wagner show you've also directed some uh, other films as well too you worked on The Who The Incredibles Stream Band yes and more you also directed A Lion's Trail A Place Like Home and The Migrant Way which is also talking about uh, in some things like in other films Exile in Their Own Land for Christian Aid which involves poverty in South Africa maybe you can uh, tell us about some of your other films uh, yeah, well, I, I, I got into making, um, what I suppose you could loosely call social documentaries. Um, Injustice in has always interested me, and I've always thought one of the best ways you can um, work in the documentary field is to try and uh, alert people to these situations. You can't really solve these situations, but you can at least make people aware of them. Mm. So I, I did a series of films in South America, actually, for the United Nations. They'd been very worried that they hadn't managed to reach their poverty target, and they couldn't work out why. Uh, so they asked uh, an independent company. In fact, the guy who was employing me at the time, <laughs> Derek Knight, um, to set up a, um, three directors to go to different parts of the world and investigate this whole thing of what was going wrong with aid, basically. So I went to Peru, which had always interested me, and spent a lot of time there researching, and then I made three films about Peru, about the uh, the um, uh, the cities and the, you know, the, the barriadas that were surrounded, where all the people from the country were coming in looking for work, about students and university students up in the Andes, and about farming. And uh, 
that was joined together with other films that were made uh, in in Africa and in and in um, Indonesia. Um, so that was three. That was a huge project um, because what we all found was that aid wasn't working because it was really being misspent. <laughs> you know, you'd buy a tractor for a guy on a farm in Peru. And he had no tools to repair it or no petrol to make it go. Oh, no. I, I was just going to ask you about the whole aid thing where there had been a big story where the aid was misused. And sometimes governments would get a hold of aid and they oh. spent it for themselves. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that happened. That happened, too. Um, but, I mean, it was also – it was it, aid was never aligned to helping the country help itself. And that was the, the nut of the problem, uh, that – that aid was given with ignorance, really. Um, you know, the idea with aid should be to help a country stand on its own feet, to improve its own agriculture. But people were, were very happy to use aid to grow coca beans for for the European or the American market and thus deprive the actual people of the country of a living. <laughs> So sometimes it worked in the opposite way, quite often in the opposite way to how it should work. Mm -hmm. So that was that was a big eye opener to me. I mean, so, it really was. So it sounds like with Peru, the people over there, it's just like it was supposed to help themselves. But then their mentality is like, you know, we're here to help other people. And that's what it sounded like. And it sounded like that there was some miscommunication about how the aid was used. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. They were, they were, they were, they were, aid was going in the wrong direction, and I think that still happens, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, we made these films, and for about two years, the United Nations were too ashamed to show them. <laughs> Eventually, oh. they did release them, but, I mean, it was kind of like a, uh, I suppose, biting off the hand that fed you. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. And, of course, with Africa, it seems to be a, a, a real hotbed when it comes to aid. It's like, you know, how do they handle their aid and how is the uh, aid pretty much mishandled in um, certain parts of Africa? Yeah, well, that's that's absolutely true. But then, I mean, Africa was – the problem for Africa was it was colonized um, by the Europeans. Uh, uh, and that kind of really is – the the, the the root problem in Africa it's never gone away. I mean, we taught them to be corrupt. <laughs> oh my goodness! I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of sins to to, to you know the European um, invasions of other countries and the, taking all their all their wealth and everything and and really, I mean, you know, the whole British Empire thing is about oh, but we taught them to be civilized. Well, you know, that just doesn't wash. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it made me think of Dr. Livingstone and, of course, you know, just a paraphrase that he told one of his people. And he says, um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it up to you to build Africa and everything else. And I think nothing was ever done about it. That's what it sounds like with some of the mentalities, like leave it for somebody else. And they just, you know, pretty much piss on it or just walk away or just misuse it. Yeah. Well, I mean, look at the Belgium Congo. Um, which which was the only private colony. The entire country was the colony of King Leopold of <laughs> and of Belgium. And he, uh, during his vicious exploitation of that country, uh, there were some five million people killed in the Congo. Wow. And it was only because some guy in the docks in London saw all these ships coming back from the Congo loaded with rubber and, you know, produce. And the ships went back loaded with guns. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And so he blew the whistle on it, you know. But that, you know, a lot of people don't know about that. It was, it was kind of, uh, uh, it was a genocide took place, really. Wow. So, I mean, that, that's probably the worst example of a colony. And the Congo is still a mess. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, you know, too, with um, other countries like, say, in Asia, see, you know, how, what's their mentality when it comes to aid and have they handled it or mishandled it or, say, parts of Europe or even like, say, in um, Russia? And I think there's maybe other parts like Australia or New Zealand. And how do you think aid was handled or mishandled in those countries and what was their mentality? 
Well, I don't, I don't know intimately. I mean, I don't, I don't know that much about Russia other than its most recent history because, <laughs> um, I mean, Russia, Russia is, a, is a very nasty dictatorship. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it's, 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 um, it's in a bad state. I mean, it's bankrupt, Russia, basically, um, because it, it, it sunk all its hopes into oil. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that depended on the assistance and cooperation of America because the Russians don't have the technology and the Americans do. So uh, when the kind of uh, the, the cooperation slackened off, Russia was left bankrupt. <laughs> and, and we thought they traded <laughs> vodka for oil. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, they were the last, last time they were, they, were, they were drilling in the Arctic, weren't they? You know, I mean, unbelievable. <laughs> Oh my! And that all fell apart because because uh, uh, the Americans withdrew from that, you know, mm -hmm. and and they didn't have the technology to do it on their own. So, wow, that is something too. And of course, you did some work for um, you know humanitarian aid with some of your films. You also worked on um, some other films with the Who, the Incredible String Band, and Yes songs and more too. And uh, I, I'd say that uh, movie, yes, is one of my favorites. And um, tell us about those and what got you inspired to, um, you know, work on the Who, Incredible String Band, yes, and others. Well, I've been working on on music films because, as I said before, it was one of my it was my other career choice. It was either music or films, and I think I was a bit better at films than music. Although <laughs> 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 I love playing music, you know. But but um, so I was always interested in combining those two loves, and uh, I'd, I'd done a few films about string quartets and uh, musical towns and things, documentaries, and then came the chance to do the Jimi Hendrix film. So having done that, I couldn't stop. So I, I went on to do a film with the Incredible String Band, who I thought were another quite out of this world band at the time. Um, so we made this film together and then I got uh, I got into doing uh, videos for, 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 for um, uh, free uh, Cat Stevens uh, Black Sabbath things like that then uh, I knew I knew Steve Howe who played in Yes so we suggested to them that we filmed their concert at Rainbow so that's where Yes Songs came along and we filmed that and we also did a, a, a fascinating roadshow film for Jethro Tull Mm -hmm. um, which which came on in the middle of a concert. It was uh, the stage would go down, a big screen would come up, and then come on this ten minute film about this ballerina who danced through a mirror and goes into this crazy world of animals. And this was Jethro Tull dressed up <laughs> as animals. <laughs> <laughs> but that was hilarious. And that, but that was that was good fun, you know. And I think after that, that's when the, um, Pete Townsend saw that and wanted us to do something with him, a similar kind of thing, which we started on, but we never kind of really got to grips with it. So, so uh, but I mean, it was... Uh, the, the Who were a, a pretty dynamic band to work with. <laughs> oh my goodness! And a, and of course, you know, seeing their films, Quadrophenia, and of course yeah. they had the Live at Leeds. And I'm trying to think, what was the other one? I think it was um, it was all, the kids, the kids are all right. That was the one I was thinking of. The kids are all right. I mean, the just kids are right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I said that's just one of the funniest. And I remember one part where it's like, you know, Keith Moon tries to undress somebody. We're like, what the heck is going on here? Keith, like, Keith Moon was totally, he was totally wild, Keith Moon. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 of course, you know, you hear about the water problems in Flint, Michigan. That's been all over the news. And I point to the genesis of all the problem with water in Flint, Michigan. Keith Moon on his 21st birthday drove his Lincoln, Lincoln Continental into the pool at a Holiday Inn in Flint, Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the problem started. Thank That's you. That's where it all began. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, he'd, he, you know, when we were filming, he'd, uh, he'd, we'd, we'd, we'd all turn up and then we'd say, where's Keith? And they'd say, oh, he's gone to Spain. But we were supposed to be filming today. <laughs> no, he just decided last night he'd go to Spain. So. <laughs> 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 and makes you wonder what is he doing? <laughs> He's a he was a brilliant drummer though. <laughs> yeah, 
He really was. I mean, uh, exceptionally talented. Much underrated as a drummer, I think, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And, and, and of course, you know, where can we find all those movies, um, including about, um, you know, humanitarian aid, Lion's Trail, and of course, um, you know, other works? Where can we find those? Uh, well, I guess the best way is to Google them now. They're probably all on YouTube. <laughs> all my films turn up on YouTube somewhere down the line. Um, obviously, United Nations films will be available from the United Nations. Uh, but a lot of the films I did were, you know, were privately sponsored in that way. But the music films are, are all around. I mean, my, my entire incredible string band film is on YouTube. I, I, I mean, I didn't say it could be, so it just appeared there. Somebody posted it. <laughs> Okay, well that's fantastic. We know what to look for as well too. And uh, what what uh, what uh, what can we expect from you in twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one and beyond, Peter? Well, that will have to be a secret. <laughs> okay, we'll keep it under wraps, and then when you're ready, you let us know, and we'll have you back on. So you just give me the date a little secret, like in code or something. So we'll do that. So <laughs> okay, I want to get this. Uh, this Jimmy film out there properly first. Uh, this it's, it's kind of obsessed me for so long. <laughs> uh, and I want to get it out of my system. Then I can then I can really get into other stuff I want to do. <laughs> sounds sounds great. We're looking forward to that, Peter. And uh, who do you consider biggest influence in your career? The biggest influence? Yes. <sighs> what in filmmaking? Uh, it can be anyone. It can be filmmaking. It can be um, whatever endeavor. It can be anything personal or, you know, you can say Jimi Hendrix offshoots or something. It's like, you know, biggest influence. You can pick anyone. Um, well, Jimmy's been a huge influence. <laughs> but I mean, I'm also I'm also a kind of avid movie goer. So uh, but I love I love a kind of uh, the art cinema. You know, I loved all the all the. Uh, Ingmar Bergman films and the, the Jean Renoir films and the, uh, the the classics, if you like. But I also love the stuff that's coming out today. You know, I mean, I'm a great fan of the Guardians films. <laughs> oh, Guardians of the Galaxy? That's yeah. my favorite. I'm looking forward to Guardians 3. I was looking forward until the pandemic hit. Now <laughs> me and my family, including my boys, have to wait till 2021 and keep saying, Dad, when's that movie coming out? I said, I don't know. I'm not in charge of it. So. <laughs> yeah, and I can, I can see endless versions of Deadpool. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's like, how, how many is out there, really? It's like, I think I've lost track on that. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's just so funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure- Ryan Reynolds is just too much. <laughs> <laughs> So I think I, I think Jimi Hendrix got to him. I can tell you that. So yeah, yeah, maybe. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? What? So they want to get into the film business? Don't, <laughs> don't. It'll kill you. <laughs> no, I mean you just have to. You have to believe in. You have to believe what you have to offer is is worthwhile because. You know, you're, if you're if you're making films, you're, you're full of doubt all the time. It's like doing anything, um, but you have to remember that if it interests you, it's going to interest somebody else. There's some, going to be somebody else on this planet who will have the same interests as you, or be inspired by the same things you are. So it's just like keep true to yourself and keep going. Follow your heart. <laughs> and that's very true, too. Once again, Peter Neal, the um, director of the new Jimi Hendrix movie, starting at zero, coming out um, you know, in September with a preview and also later in the year. Peter, very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Or as they say in England, Ab Fab, looking forward to him again soon. Once again, tell us about your upcoming projects, what's your website, how do people contact you, where can um, – People uh, check out uh, starting at zero. Well, you can check out. There's a there's a book out which is simply starting at zero dot com hyphenated starting dash at dash zero dot com. That will tell you about the book and something about me. But the event we're putting on is called Jimi Hendrix Returns. So if you just uh, uh, put in Jimi Hendrix Returns as one word dot earth. You'll get our website, 
and you'll get the book website and you'll get all the information about uh, about what we're trying to do. That is fantastic. Once again, Peter, a very big thank you for your time. You've been fantastic. Looking forward to having you again soon. Do us a favor. Keep us up to date. We'd love you to have back on in 2020 and 2020 on one beyond. And you've been great. And we'll just meet somewhere along the Watchtower. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike. It's been great. Thank you for having me. <laughs> the Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. If you're looking to start or upgrade your online presence, visit www.sonicwebstudios.com for all of your online needs. Sonic Web Studios specializes in custom web design, app development, social networking, search engine optimization, domain registration, email marketing, online stores, and more. Since our birth, we have been designing and developing immaculate websites and providing web solutions which are a cut above the rest. As a leading web designing enterprise, we have a team of extremely talented web designers designers who are well focused and have the experience of working on multiple web developing platforms such as PHP, Magento, Custom WordPress and more. Sonic Web Studios has been helping businesses of all kinds whether big, small, established or startup impress their audiences with exemplary web solutions. We don't just create beautiful and functional websites, we give you a complete online solution with the main goal of enhancing your yearly revenues. We aim to give your business the online exposure and brand acknowledgement that will help you in achieving increased conversions leading to profitable sales. Call 1-800-303-3960 or visit us online at www.sonicwebstudios.com to get started today. Mention the Mike Wagner Show and get 20% off your project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Thanks for listening to The Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. The Mike Wagner Show can be heard on Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Anchor FM, Radio Public, and themikewagnershow.com. Please support our program with your donations at themikewagnershow.com. Join us again next time for another great episode of The Mike Wagner Show. 